Ring ring cling, I'm sal. Ring ring shring, ka e i la ring. Ha sa ka ha la ring, sa ka la ring. Sal I'm cling ring shring. Aum. Namaste. So this is the beginning of a new series about the astrology of a sage. You know, very few people can recognize an actually enlightened person. And the reason for that is, it takes one to know one. So only someone who is very advanced themselves can actually directly recognize a liberated soul. But it's been my experience that astrologers have an extra mechanism for insight into a person's actual nature. And so in this series, we're going to be examining the birth chart of a sage, of an enlightened being, and pointing out the structures and the inner correspondences that reveal his actual nature. So, because astrology is a very ancient science, huh, it goes back before written history, a lot of people in modern days want to change it or, you know, make some additions to it or some original work on it, but actually it's already perfect just the way it is. For example, when Vedic astrology was translated into Greek and Latin, there was certain mistakes that were made. And among the worst of them, that the instruction, the zero degrees of Aries is the vernal equinox the spring equinox, the beginning of the year, astrologically. Now, at the time that the translation was made, that the, the vernal equinox was at zero degrees Aries. But since then, about 1800 years, the equinox has moved with the precession of the sun's orbit. And so that is no longer true. Unfortunately, Western astrology took this as a dogma. And so as the sun's precession moved the equinoxes around the zodiac, they have artificially moved all the constellations too. And now it amounts to an error of 23 degrees and something. So in other words, Western astrology is crippled from the start because they're using the wrong zodiac. It doesn't correspond to the position of the stars in the sky. So everything is off by 23 degrees. How can they get accurate predictions or insights into an individual's personality? Well, they can't. This is why people, intelligent people, reject astrology because Western astrology is the only one they know. So besides that, there are many other errors in Western astrology and it's pretty much useless. I mean, I tried to learn it when I was, I don't know, 22, 23 years old and I just couldn't get anywhere with it. It didn't, it didn't fit, you know, <laughs> it didn't work for me. So I dropped it and then many years later, I discovered Jyotish, Vedic astrology. And from the very start of studying Vedic astrology, it was like, yes, <laughs> this works. This is practical. This is the real thing. So this chart analysis is going to be using Jyotish or Vedic astrology. So it's going to be different from the Western astrology, even the charts are different and everything. 
so if your background is in Western astrology, you're just going to have to get used to this because <laughs> we don't use Western astrology at all anymore. It just doesn't work, you know, it's not accurate. So that being said, in general, astrology is about probabilities. In other words, one single placement in a chart does not guarantee a certain result or a certain phenomenon is going to manifest. More likely, if there are several placements that mutually reinforce each other, that dramatically increases the chances that uh, this is a good reading or this is a, this is a good indication of what the person is like or what the events are going to happen in their lives. Now, the thing about this is destiny is not about uh, chances. It's not about probability. Destiny is a certainty. What is meant to happen is going to happen, no matter how much you try to stop it. And what is not going to happen can't happen no matter how hard you try to make it happen. So the astrological chart as an indication of destiny has to be taken as a whole. Okay, we're going to go through and look at the pieces one by one. But in the end, the reading has to take into account the entire chart or else there's a danger of going off because of thinking something indicates a certainty when it actually doesn't. In other words, we ha you have to go through the whole chart in order to understand the person that you're trying to read. So now we're going to take the Jyotish chart of this sage. And this is a contemporary sage. It's someone that we know. So we have their life and their experience as a guide. For interpretation. So here's the overall chart. This is the South Indian style chart. And as you can see, the positions of the signs, fixed stars, are fixed. Pisces, Taurus, uh, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and so on, arranged clockwise on the chart, beginning with the upper left hand corner. But the houses correspond to the full signs. So the ascendant, for example, is in Pisces, 23 degrees Pisces. That means that Pisces, the whole sign of Pisces is the whole first house. So this is called equal house chart. Anyway, I'm saying all these things to accommodate those who only studied Western astrology. Uh, and in Vedic astrology, I have to say a couple more things before starting in on this chart. In Vedic astrology, the sun sign is not really that important. The rising and the moon signs, however, are very important. Because the rising sign describes the body, the anamaya kosha, the, the gross body, the vehicle the earthly presence. And the moon describes the mind. The sun, of course, describes the personality, the ego. And so personality and ego is not given much weight in Jyotish. Because personality, individuality, ego, all these things are basically an illusion. So we don't count it so much, but it does reveal what the person thinks about themselves and to a certain degree how they appear to others. But actually the rising sign gives a great deal more information about how the person shows up in the world. So let's take a look at the ascendant in this chart. What is the ascendant? In Vedas it's called Lagna. Lagna points toward the physical identity. Its particular definitions include the place in the social order 
where the native feels most natural, and the general view of society in assessing the native's contributions. Indications of the first house are physique, complexion, longevity, fame, status, appearance, and wealth. These should be assessed from the rising sign, the lagna. From the first house should be considered everything about the native's body, complexion, marks or moles, longevity, manner of living, caste, temperament, happiness, or otherwise. Now, an important insight to take from this quote is that caste, or varna, is not determined by birth. Krishna says this in Bhagavad Gita, Chatur varnyam maya shrishtam guna karma vibhagasaha, that this system of four social classes was invented by me. He's speaking as Brahman now, or as Shakti. But they are determined by guna and karma, quality and the results of work. So this is revealed by the astrological chart. And in ancient days, a person's varna, what we now call caste, but caste carries that baggage of uh, determination by birth. Varna really means that a person is classified by their astrological chart, especially the rising sign and some other indications in the uh, D9 chart, uh, the Navangsha chart. So this person has Lagna in Pisces, 23 degrees Pisces. Pisces is the luminous appearance of a fish shimmering in the waters. It's like impressionistic. It's not hard edged. Pisces is also a mutable sign. That means the person here has the ability to change. In fact, the, almost the uh, nature of the person is change. You cannot expect them to remain steady or solid uh, because that's not their nature. So Pisces is probably the most mutable sign. And not only that, the people born in Pisces bridge between two worlds, the material and the spiritual world. They are the way showers, they're natural gurus. They are the ones who ferry the souls between this world and the next world. The way shower, the ferryman. This is the nature of Pisces and especially in this nakshatra, Revati Nakshatra. So in Revati Nakshatra, this is the last of the 27 nakshatras. So I probably have to explain nakshatra. <laughs> Every month, the moon takes 28 days to go around. So the 27 nakshatras are the days of the moon, just like the 12 months are the signs of the sun. So the months begin actually when the moon is new, each month in the Vedic calendar. And then sometimes to adjust the calendar, there has to be an intercalary uh, nakshatra and or an intercalary month, just like a leap year in the West. Now the advantage of this system is that it enables us to predict the weather. It enables us to fix the time of holy days and all many other functions that should be performed in spiritual life. So now we're back to the nakshatra. Uh, Revati is the last nakshatra, just like Pisces is the last sun sign. Revati is the last moon sign, the last day of the moon. So Revati in Pisces this indicates a soul in their last incarnation, in their last birth, especially if it's supported by other indications in the chart. So the meaning of this, I found a very good book on esoteric astrology, which I'm quoting from. The veils between the two worlds 
bridge pathways to the world of the ancestors. Imagination and dreams, or constituent parts of the trance state, portal of the astral material bridge. The native receives private nonverbal guidance toward the development of personal interior wisdom and compassion, or guru, and private clairsentient guidance across the bridge from material waking life to meditative astral dream life. So this is very, very amazing uh, indication for this particular sage. And, uh, oh, it goes on to say, I mean, there's so much, so much here, more than I can quote. The Shakti of this nakshatra is the power of nourishment symbolized by milk. Revati is one of the most benefic nakshatras for spiritual growth and development of psychic abilities. Pushana, the ruler of Revati, is the conductor, the Pied Piper, the muse, the curriculum of musical imagination and shepherding compassion, the conductor, the shining one, the sun. Revati is a shining light who shows the path to others. May I be protector for those without one, a guide for all travelers on the way. May I be a bridge, a boat, and a ship for all who wish to cross the water. There's so much more here. <laughs> I wish I could go really into this in depth, but you get the point. This being is born at a time when the planets are arranged in such a way as to support the activities of a guru. A guru, after all, is one who brings the soul from the earthly plane to the spiritual plane, from this world to the next world. He is the boatman who shepherds the soul across the river between life and death and what is beyond. So that would be uh, pretty good if it was the only indication in the chart, but it's very much supported by quite a few others, and we'll go into them in the future installments. But the one that I want to share with you right now is that the exact degree of the rising sign in the Navangsa chart, 28 degrees Capricorn, is also the precise position of exalted Mars in the birth chart, the D1 chart. So this is confirmation of the power of this rising sign. It's not uh, just an ordinary birth, but it has an exalted planet supporting it and giving it tremendous energy. Now, when I show this placement to other astrologers, they all say, well, this means the person is fantastically wealthy, like Bill Gates. Huh? Incredible, amazing wealth. And I say, you know what? This person is not materially wealthy at all. <laughs> and they're always shocked. And then they say, oh, well, that means that person's wealth is spiritual. That person is enormously wealthy in spiritual assets. But because these assets are invisible, intangible, and can only be uh, recognized by people on the same level or nearly the same level, this person has remained unrecognized except by some his astrologers and some very other close people. So, see, this is the nature of the liberated soul. Like Ramana Maharshi. Ramana was a complete uh, mystery to his own family, to his friends, and everyone around him, even after his enlightenment. And finally, after years, some very high sages, especially Sheshadri Swamigal, uh, recognized him 
because they were on the same level. And then they started to protect him, and that's how his fame grew. So the same is true of any enlightened being, but because sages are so rare in this world, they often go unrecognized. And the Buddha called these uh, private Buddhas. Uh, he said, these are the unrecognized Buddhas that attain self-realization, but for one reason or another, they never taught. They never came out in public. Then they never revealed who they really are. Which a Sanchari Buddha uh, is, a, is a great loss to society. It's a great loss to this world because only such a person can give actual guidance that leads to success in spiritual life or complete self-realization. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.